thank you all for coming. Uh, if you will indulge me, we'll begin, as I always do, both my classes, my public lectures. I hit this bell. Sit up straight in your chair and let your eyes gently close. Focus your attention on your breath. The rise and fall of your chest or the place at the base of the nose where breath enters the body. Find yourself supported by the chair, the chair by the floor, the floor by the building, and the building by the earth, which holds us all. And for a few moments, let your mind do whatever it wants to do while you focus on your breath. Very slowly and very gently open your eyes. Okay. In a sense, in a sense, that's all I'm going to do today. So if you get tired or bored, just close your eyes and go back to that state of mind. Because what is that state of mind? It's the capacity to detach with awareness from your normal conscious mind your normal conscious mind being the seat, the focus of your normal ego with its attachments, its fears, its compulsions, and its senses of separation. But you probably want a little bit more than that, so I will give you a little bit more than that. So what I'm going to do is read a little and talk a little from the book, which is, thank God, uh, going to be sent out on Thursday, be done with it. Uh, I will try to give you both an overview of the project as a whole, which is to make sense of the concept of spirituality in a way that synthesizes, summarizes, and advocates for an understanding of what this concept means, both historically and in the present. And I'll also try to give you in much more detail in a couple of passages that I'll read, a couple of particular points that I'll discuss, a sense of what it can mean in a very particular setting. As I said to uh, Jeff, uh, before some of these pages I have re rewritten 25 times. So by God, somebody's going to hear them actually read the way they were written. So I'm just uh, simply going to read the uh, preface and the introduction. That will be the start. That will take about eight or nine minutes. It's only about four pages. So preface, which begins with a quote from Thoreau. I would not talk so much about myself if there were anyone else whom I knew so well. I was a high school senior, and though I was doing well in my classes and had friends and a wide range of interests, I was also bitterly disappointed that after three years on the wrestling team, I simply wasn't good enough to make the varsity. An unexpected sophomore, tutored by his star athlete older brother, arrived at practice one day and promptly beat me out for the 145 pound spot. Like pretty much everything else in my life, I'd worked hard at wrestling, but unlike some other things, mainly those concerned with books, it hadn't come easy. I wasn't very strong, and no matter what I did, I couldn't seem to get that much stronger. But wrestling meant something to me, something it took me years to fully understand. It was a way to prove that even though I was an intellectual who loved reading and classical music, I too was a real man, as tough as the other types of guys, not just a soft Jewish kid with thick glasses. And here in my third year of grueling two and a half hour practices, I was failing. I obsessed over my failure, tried to lick my wounds and get over it, but felt it as a relentless, nagging unease. Fortunately, at the same time, I was rereading Thoreau's Walden. On my first encounter with the book, I had been taken by his celebration of nature, perhaps even more the way he thumbed his nose or what a few years later I would disdainfully call the establishment. This time, something else struck me. Live as deliberately as nature, he counseled, and instead of seeking wealth or success or status, find a center of awareness and contentment that no accomplishment or possession can replace and no social failure dislodge. Dig deep into your soul and reach out to the universe and you will find contentment. And so my first encounter with spirituality's wise and healing response to the pains of life came to me from Thoreau. I would like to say that his soothing insights calmed my disappointment and insecurity, but they did not. 
Although I sensed that he was, in the deepest sense, right about how to live, I still held a burning hunger for achievement and recognition, a painful belief that I only deserved love if I succeeded, over and over again. Eighteen years later, after encounters with Zen Buddhism, Kierkegaard, psychedelics, Hasidic mystical stories, yoga, meditation, Jewish renewal, and a year-long trip through India vastly enlarged my sense of what spirituality could be, I faced a much darker and more demanding test. My first child, Aaron, was born a month early with severe brain damage, never left the hospital, and lived only 65 days. My hopes for bonding with an infant and raising a son or daughter turned into the nightmare of Aaron connected to tubes and beeping machines, tormented by the hospital's well-meaning and near-endless tests. In, the, in his final moments, lungs and immune system overwhelmed by pneumonia, he died in our arms. What was I to do with my grief? My rage at fate and bitter envy of people who had normal, healthy children. No psychotherapy could cure this malaise, nor could the banal pieties, all of which my wife and I actually heard, of God took Aaron's spirit, or you must have done something bad in a previous life, or you're better off. Only a spiritual response could even temporarily soothe my aching heart. I would think of the love which, despite everything, we had been able to show Aaron, and of a similar desperate love against all odds I saw from other parents on the neurology floor of Children's Hospital. The ways I would usually distance myself from those other parents, who weren't leftists or educated or counterculture types, were erased by a commonality of shared suffering and compassion. I tried to see the miracle of life that was in all children, even if none of them were mine. I realized that unless I faced the depth of my grief and my crushing sense of failure over my inability to protect my son, I was doomed to endless heartache. And I began to understand that the radical politics I had been part of for a decade, the hyper-intellectualized techniques of academic philosophy in which I'd earned a doctorate, and my conventional pursuit of pleasure and career success simply paled in front of Aaron's death. But that this other thing, spirituality, was my only hope. Introduction. Quote, not God, but life, more life, a larger, richer, more satisfying life, is in the last analysis the end of religion. William James. America is filled with people who say they are spiritual but not religious, a news story tells us, as if the two ideas repel each other. Yet a leading Catholic publisher advertises extensive offerings in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic spirituality. Amazon lists 282 books in the general area of spirituality and aging, and 14 on spirituality and art therapy alone. A casual internet search turns up a listing of over 400 spiritual retreat centers. These examples could be multiplied indefinitely into politics and art, medicine and poetry, exercise and gardening, into virtually every religious tradition, and into contexts where the ideas of God, church, or scripture do not appear at all. What is spirituality, and is there any coherent way to understand it? How can we, can we make sense of ideas like a spiritual center, a spiritual director, or a spiritual experience? Or know what a person is doing when she responds to a life crisis spiritually instead of some other way? Taking a spiritual lesson from a disappointment which might otherwise be a crushing setback. But first, is it so important that people use spirituality, spiritual, and spiritually in a wide variety of contradictory ways? Is that not just like the way people talk about religion or marriage? True enough. But it is also true that our understanding of an idea is not something that only interests authors of dictionaries, but is an embodiment of our values and ideals. That is why differences over religion or marriage really can lead to really intense conflicts. How we understand something shapes how we live it. But why should we want to understand or live spirituality? This deserves two answers. For a large group of people in today's world, including myself, spirituality is essential to who we are. What it asks of us is A, perhaps the central task in life. And therefore, it is important that we understand it as best we can. But what of those people who, whose focus in life is traditional religion, art, the military, career advancement, or economic success? Who seek social status, political power, cutting edge scientific knowledge, or simply a good time? Why should any of these care what spirituality is or isn't? Well, the whole book is an answer to this question, but here's the highly condensed version. In the early 1970s, I was a somewhat hard-nosed philosophy graduate student, but had also begun to study kundalini yoga, practice involving dynamic postures, intense breathing, chanting, and meditation. 
One evening I went to a lecture by the guru of Kundalini, Yogi Bhajan, a cheerful bearded Sikh with a big booming laugh and a big belly. He offered what I would later recognize as the basics of non-denominational spirituality. Make a fundamental change in your life by letting go of your ego, surrendering your attachments, doing away with greed, and manifesting kindness and compassion. When he asked for questions, I stood up in the slightly pretentious, I'm an academic philosopher, tone, asked him, I see what you are saying, but tell me why I ought to do any of these things. In other words, why should I live a spiritual life? Where were the justifications and motivations? Undaunted by either the question or my manner, Yogi Bhajan was relaxed and clear in his response. I am not saying that you ought to. I am simply saying you will never be happy, never have real peace of mind or serenity, unless you do. This, in essence, is the point. For all their association with soothing music, peaceful country settings, and non-judgmental love, spiritual teachings are actually quite radical. They propose a sweeping transformation how we live, and assert that only through such a transformation are lasting happiness and true contentment possible. Of course, if things are going really well for you, if you are healthy and good-looking and smart, successful and well taken care of, you might not take up spirituality on its offer to make your life better. For spiritual values typically enter our lives when something goes wrong, or at least isn't working right. When a beloved child is hopelessly disabled by a drunk driver, a husband walks out on a 20-year marriage, you get everything you thought you wanted and are still unsatisfied. You go to church and wonder what you're doing there, or find out that modern industrial society is extinguishing a species every 10 minutes. Then it is to the spirit that you may turn. Or, spirituality may come into our lives as something unexpected and miraculous. We feel a source of joy so profound, a connection to everyone and everything so complete, that our usual goals, pleasures, and sense of self dwindle in comparison. Some people will call these moments of God, or truth, or the real self. Freud talked of an oceanic feeling. An 11-year-old boy excitedly asks his older brother, does everyone really know they are alive? We may be awed by the wonder of birth, an unexpected kindness, music that for a few moments makes life seem utterly complete, or a universe of stars in a night sky. So powerful and true are these moments we tell ourselves that we will do anything to hold on to them so we can live in their light. In the face of sorrow, in response to joy, with or without organized religion and belief in God, in tight-knit communities or in silence and solitude, in disciplines of our minds or bodies or hearts, in all these ways spiritual life beckons, offering incomparable rewards and an equally extreme set of demands. Okay. So that sets the stage. Notice from the start that this is direct. It's intense, it's personal. Spirituality may be many things. It is never abstract, impersonal, or ap academic. Ultimately, it is about the value, the purpose, and the fulfillment of each one of our lives. What I say here, what I say in the book, is, I believe, a distillation of 2,500 years of these teachings. What's original has to do with the contours of my particular life my historical situation, and the particular way in which I combine spirituality with progressive politics. What is the basic idea of spirituality? The basic idea is that as we face difficulties in life, fear, anxiety, illness, a child who is in deep trouble, a career that doesn't work out, a sense of purposelessness, a sense of loss, being oppressed and suffering from oppression. As we face these and countless other conditions of disappointment, of emotional unease, there are ways to respond. These ways to respond I define as the spiritual virtues. And for me, spirituality is essentially about a view of life, the attempt to live by that view, and the experiences which that attempt gives rise to. An understanding of life, the attempt to live by it, and the experiences which that attempt gives rise to, and these are all keyed around certain spiritual virtues. If you are anxious, learn to quiet your mind. If you find yourself endlessly focused on what you don't have, learn to be generous. If you are suffering from endless rage because of what somebody did to you, confront your grief and learn to empathize, have some compassion for the person who hurt you. If you are lonely, make a connection. If you feel deprived, be generous. On and on and on. 
awareness or mindfulness, one. Acceptance or equanimity, two. Gratitude and generosity, three. Compassion, four. And love and connection to other people, to God, if you have a theistic spirituality, and to nature. Those are the key spiritual virtues. As virtues, the essential promise is, this is good for everybody. These are not rules to which you must conform. These are not sins which we have to, these are not to compensate for your sins, so we have to whip you into shape to manage them. These are forms of life, habits of thought, habit of action, habits of reflection, which if you practice them, this is the essential spiritual teaching, which if you practice them will provide you the only long-lasting, solid sense of happiness and contentment, and will make you a hell of a lot more fun to be around. Okay, so a virtue is basically something which is not a law which externally controls you, but is motivated from your own growing sense that the only way to happiness is through these virtues. Take an example. Okay, if you go into a park on any pleasant spring day uh, around the United States, you're liable to see runners, right? Super slim teenage girls, uh, overweight middle-aged men wearing dirty t-shirts and grim faces, uh, perfect weightlifter types, and almost all of them have on their wrist something that looks like this, right? A chronograph which will tell the time, serve it as an alarm, and also be a stopwatch. And if you notice them running, periodically they do this, right? They look at their arm. What are they doing? A lot of them, myself included, are trying to prove something. How fast I can run, am I in good shape, have I done it well? They are expressing, they are exerting an external calculation to measure their worth. Now from a spiritual point, there's nothing wrong with running. From a spiritual point of view, there's nothing wrong with not running either. But there is something deeply problematic about tying yourself to an external, abstract, and not particularly rational evaluation of what you are as a person. This is why there's a tremendous number of running and other sports-related injuries, because people marry themselves to this external calculation in order to prove themselves in ways which they'll never be fully satisfied that they've proved themselves, so they have to do it over and over and over and over again. Now, if running isn't your thing, there are other numbers besides the number on the watch, which might be the numbers that you are key to. For some men, and for a lot of women, it might be the numbers of the dress size or the scale. It might be the numbers of times you had sex last, night, last week. It might be the number of friends you have on Facebook. It might be the grades on your children's report card. It might be how many books you've written. It might be anything through which you identify yourself with some external measure. Now, from a spiritual point of view, this is a profound error, and there is an alternative. We can simply run and enjoy the grace and power of our bodies. We can enjoy our bodies in terms of their appearance, no matter what they look like. We can appreciate our families, even if they're far from perfect. We can do our work in the world without attachment to results or recognition or success. We can treasure what we have, even if we don't have nearly as much as we thought we were going to get, as we think we deserve, or as we want. Something else is possible says the spiritual point of view. Now initially, this might have a certain exotic appeal. After all, if you are fixated on what you don't have, a lover, nice parents, a good car, health, and here this perspective says, look, there's a way to live with contentment, with happiness, even without that. Well, there might be something in that. It would be a little bit like the reverse of the fairy tale in which we get three wishes. You rub a lamp, you get three wishes, and typically when you get those wishes, you're worse off than you were before. Only here, you get the lamp, you rub it, and nothing happens, except you feel better. However, at the same time, this may feel very far away from you. The successfully socialized ego, the sense of self, how you define yourself, how you understand what's important to you, 
what you wake up thinking about every morning, what you obsess about when you can't stop yourself from obsessing, the successfully socialized ego says, if I don't possess, control, measure, measure up, if I'm not perennially being reassured by personal contact of some kind or other, if I don't have those things, how will I live? It just seems impossible, even if there's a, an appeal to it because you feel lousy and this thing says you can feel better. Even if that's the case, you might feel it's out of reach. Now, one response to this is to say, no, it's not that out of reach. Spirituality is a natural condition of humankind. So are a lot of other things. But it's natural, it's accessible. It's accessible. What you might want to do is think back to those particular moments when you felt a source of joy, connection, or completion, or contentment. And those things were not dependent on the normal social identity of owning, controlling, possessing, separating, and defending. It might have been some particularly intense sexual encounter. It might be a sunset from a mountaintop. It might have been an encounter with music. It might be watching a child take his first steps. It might be when somebody did you an unexpected kindness. It might be when you saw that despite a lot of differences between you and somebody else, you really had more in common than you thought. If you've ever had an experience like that, if you were ever really nice to somebody, even though you felt lousy yourself, if you ever chose to feel good when you could feel bad, if you ever find yourself recognizing, yes, I have something precious, even though these other things I don't have, then you have a beginning sense of what spirituality is. It's not up in the heavens. It's right here on earth. I'll give you three uh, examples of how this is expressed. The Baal Shem Tov was a 18th century rabbi who was the founder, the originator of what's called Hasidic Judaism. Uh, his mystical teachings had a profound effect within Judaism, and he's taken as a mentor, a spiritual exemplar in other traditions as well. Baal Shem Tov said, the world is filled with wonders and miracles. We take our little eyes, we place them over our hands, and we see nothing. Now, this is a very interesting thing to say, because the Baal Shem Tov, as an Orthodox Jew, comes from a tradition which emphasizes very unusual miracles, right? The parting of the Red Sea for the Jews, the burning bush. These weren't things that happened all the damn time. They happened once, you know, twice in a, in a good millennium, right? But they, you know, so what is he talking about? Well, to my mind, what is he clearly talking about is the miraculous nature of the everyday. The birds singing out your window. The fact that on my way to the bus stop, I, my eyes can see the brilliant red of the new tulips. Somebody practicing scales on a flute. The way a hug from somebody who loves you feels. Very ordinary things. Second example. Some of you may have read a book called uh, The Death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy, which is one of the great spiritual literary creations of all times, in, in my view. Ivan Illich is a guy who grows up in a fairly standard upper middle or lower upper uh, class family in Russia. He adopts all the conventions of upper class Russian society, careerism, de emotional detachment, professional distance, and a sort of obsessive concern with material possessions and his house and making things pleasant. Throughout his life, he never cares for anybody. He emotionally abandons his wife, who goes through periods of difficult pregnancy. He separates himself from his family by his work and playing cards. Everything is going the way it's supposed to go in this social setting until he gets sick. He develops a mysterious illness, which gradually is clearly going to kill him. In his deathbed, he feels abandoned by people just as he had abandoned him, and is subjected to the same kind of professional distance by the doctors that he subjected other people to in his role in the law courts. He starts to think, maybe there was something wrong with the way I lived. Because this crisis, this health crisis, cracks open his normal ego. Maybe there was something wrong. Of course, he resists that. How could it be? I was going up in public opinion. I was making more money. I was getting a better position. But eventually, he realizes that instead of going up, he was actually going down. That he had not lived as he should have lived. And then, with crystal clarity, a very simple thought occurs to him. It was simple. He was sorry for his son and his wife who were in the room while he's screaming with pain. He was sorry for them. 
he wished they wouldn't suffer. And with that, the pain falls away from him, and in Tolstoy's language, he breaks through into the light. The simplest of concerns with somebody else, compassion, love and connection, is all it takes to totally transform Ivan Illich's experience of these last moments of his life. This is what spirituality offers, but it ain't free, and it ain't cheap either. To get there requires a great sacrifice. What do you have to sacrifice? Well, I've been using the term several times now. Your ego, my ego, my attachment, my attempt to control, my bargaining which says I'll be happy if this happens, I'll be satisfied if I can control that. That's what you have to give up. If you're going to see the Baal Shem Tov's miracles, you have to give up your attachment to the very expensive and the special, because those are not everyday life that the Baal Shem Tov is talking about. You also have to give up a certain kind of commitment to control. You have to realize that what we get is a gift. That's what makes a miracle special. It's a gift. It's not something we earned. It's not something we can expect. It's a gift. Did we earn the existence of color? After all, it could have been a gray world. We could have managed with different shades of gray. No, we have color. Did we earn the existence of music? Did we earn the right to be here, to dance on this earth? From a spiritual point of view, no, we did not. It's a miracle. It's a gift. Ivan Illich's of the world have to give up their attachment to career success and their refusal to face the fact that life has suffering, life has pain in it. One reason nobody could talk to him, nobody could comfort him in his illness, is that he lived in a social circle which totally rejected the idea of pain and suffering. They wouldn't talk about it, they wouldn't confront it. So things have to be sacrificed in order to get what you want. Okay. I have said a number of times already that uh, one thing we have to renounce to pursue a spiritual life is a certain kind of attachment, a certain kind of compulsion. From a spiritual point of view, getting what you want through any compulsion, attachment, desperation, need, addiction, never going to work. Now, from a conventional point of view, this sounds very strange. From a conventional point of view, the problem is not wanting stuff. The problem is not getting it. If I get it, <laughs> everything's fabulous. From a spiritual point of view, it's not that way. From a spiritual point of view, there's a direct analogy between us, ordinary people, going about our lives, pursuing career, pursuing sensual pleasure, pursuing money, pursuing good works, pursuing anything with a kind of desperate attachment to it, and any kind of addict. After all, if you think of the heroin addict, what does that person do? They concentrate all their life's energy into the next shot. They get the shot. For an hour, they feel terrific. After that hour, what happens? More and more and more time passes. They feel worse and worse and worse and worse. The success, the satisfaction is purely temporary and it guarantees that you're going to feel worse and worse and worse very soon. From a spiritual point of view, we're the same. We just aren't so simplified. We haven't simplified matters so much like an addict. The commitment, the attachment, the desperation is going to make us unhappy. You'll get what you want, and then you'll get bored. You'll get what you want and be frightened that it's going to change, or you won't have it anymore. You won't get what you want, and you'll feel disappointed. You'll get what you want and feel that somebody else got more. Getting what you want is not the source of happiness. Learning to be happy with what you get is. Now, if we talk about attachment in this way, then three questions immediately arise. Okay? Three questions about attachment. Question one is, if I'm not driven, if I'm not attached, if I don't want, if I don't desire, why will I do anything? Why will I get out of bed in the morning? Why will I sit there like a lump, lacking any kind of desires, and not function at all? Spiritual traditions have an answer to this, and what they do is they make a distinction between the typical goal-oriented, compulsive, let's publish another book at all costs, um, mentality, and a kind of free, spontaneous, creative engagement with reality that's the mark of a more spiritually developed person. There's constantly within spiritual literature a comparison of human beings to animals, to plants, the idea that you can give what you have 
in an energetic and creative way without being compelled to do it by addiction or by attachment or by the need to succeed. There's a classic Zen story uh, about this where there was a monk who wanted to build a monastery. So for 15 years he walks up and down the length and breadth of China, he finally gets enough money to build a monastery, a terrible flood happens, he gives all the money to flood relief. Walks up and down for the next 15 years, gathering money, about to build a monastery, ah, then there's a famine, gives all the money for famine relief. Finally, 15 years, it's a good year. He's got enough money, finally a good year. He's been doing this for 45 years. His feet are tired. I think your knees hurt. Uh, he finally has enough money. He builds the monastery. Somebody comes and says, wow, what a beautiful monastery. It's not bad, says the monk. You should have seen the first two. Right? It's not that we don't function, but if we can't get what we want, if something else comes along, if we see that this is not the time we can switch into another mode. This kind of action is possible. Okay, second question. It's one thing somebody might say to be attached to money, a bigger car, uh, you know, making out with somebody at a party on Friday night. It's one thing to be attached to those. What about desires that are less self-concerned and more for others? What if my child is sick? What's wrong with wanting my child to be healthy? From a spiritual point of view, love and care and compassion are, of course, are positive things, but desperation is not. It does not help to be in despair because your child is sick. It does not help to feel compulsively that you have to change your husband who's an alcoholic. You can love him, but you cannot necessarily change him. Do your best, is a familiar cliche, spiritual cliche, and leave the rest to God. Now, this is not boring old religion. This is a hard-nosed, ultra-realistic assessment of what life is actually about. A great deal of life is simply out of our control. The most powerful country will find itself attacked by terrorists. The most powerful country will find itself unable to stop oil gushing out of the seabed. For God knows how many days it gushed out of that well in the Gulf of Mexico. The richest people will get sick and old and die. Not necessarily in that order. Right? The best parents will have children who, God forbid, get killed in car crashes or become alcoholics. We cannot control. We can will the good and try to participate in it, but we cannot control it. And spiritually, that's a critically important lesson. Third question about attachment. It's one thing, we might say, to make our peace with, eh, I got fired, or uh, my wife is leaving me for another man, and in such case I can still say, well, I have my eyesight, I have my health, I still have some other good things. It's one thing to negotiate the difficulties of life in those kinds of settings. What about social evil? What about the monstrous injustices? How am I supposed to feel content or serene, or peaceful, or loving, or accepting of the Holocaust, of my tribe poisoned for yet more oil development. How am I supposed to feel good when those things are going on? This is a complicated question. There are many, I approach it many different times in the books. The short initial answer is that, first of all, Suffering is not something we toss out when we embrace a spiritual life. We learn to accept the suffering and work with it. The second thing is that a frequent response to social injustice is a compulsive, uh, out-of-control anger at those responsible, which is very hard not to have. I spent about 35 years manifesting that in my own life. Uh, it took me a long time to deal with that one. These things get us no place. They simply create an atmosphere of rage that's going to be repeated in whatever context you function in and create a kind of self-misery that does not add anything positive to the world. Of course, if you witness injustice, if you yourself are a victim of, of oppression, it's as natural to feel emotional pain as it is to feel physical pain if somebody punches you in the face. But from a spiritual point of view, we feel the pain. If we are sad, we cry. If we are angry, we feel the anger. But then we work through those things. 
and the anger does not get converted into bitterness or rage or reproducing the violence to somebody else. And the grief turns to an expansive gratitude for what we have left. And as well, it leads us, from a spiritual point of view, not just to look at all the other people who are committing these terrible sins, but to look at ourselves. On the virtue of loving connection to other people, it's required that we look at our own behavior. We may not be the source of great suffering in the world, but have we never turned a blind eye to oppression? Have we not cons agreed with or paid our taxes to support aggressive foreign policies? Have we not walked by literally or figuratively while other people are starving? Of course we have. So the pumped up self of self-righteous rage at the oppressor gets replaced by a sense not of acceptance of injustice, but a recognition of the shared responsibility for it. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot here. I haven't done this as a talk yet, so I guess I could have gone on for about another four hours, but I, I feel that would really be tedious. So uh, let me just say uh, a couple of more things, then we'll get into the examples. Um, what is a spiritual life? Well, it's one guided by these virtues. How do you get these virtues into your life? You might intellectually think that, gee, it would be nice to be compassionate, to have loving connection, to be, have equanimity. Well, you get there by a kind of practice or practices. Meditation, prayer, yoga, study of sacred texts, service in the world. Things you do over and over and over again. There's an old joke about a guy with a violin in his hand. He's in New York and he's looking for the concert hall. He goes to an old man. He, he says, do you know where I can get to Lincoln Center with the New York Philharmonic play? The old man looks at the violin, looks at the guy, looks at the violin. He says, simple. Practice, practice, practice. It is the same way with spirituality. You might be catapulted to the heights of spiritual enlightenment by an experience, by a sunset, by taking LSD, by encountering a charismatic teacher. But then you're liable to fall right back to exactly where you were. The only change being some sense that some other form of life is possible. How do you get there? By practices. What's interesting, however, and this is one of the things that took me a long time to figure out while I was writing the book, is that there is nothing which in itself is spiritual. No practice. Meditation, not inherently spiritual. Yoga, not inherently spiritual. Praying, not inherently spiritual. Communing with trees, like I have my students do, not inherently spiritual. Something is or is not spiritual, a teacher, a book, a statement, a practice, is or is not spiritual depending on the context. That is to say, it's spiritual if it's moving you in the direction of developing the spiritual virtues. So that it's great if you live a very harried life and you say, I'm going to take 20 minutes every day. I'm going to sit and do that little exercise like Gottlieb started his lecture with. That's called the Vipassana Insight Meditation. It's a Buddhist tradition. I'm going to do that. I'm going to let my mind slow down, let my blood pressure calm down. I'm just going to focus a little bit and see if I can develop some kind of awareness, kind of knowledge of my mind. In that case, meditation for you is spiritual because you're developing the spiritual virtue of mindfulness. But what happens when you become attached to the practice of meditation? So that if you can't get to your usual spot for 20 minutes, you get really enraged at somebody. Or what happens if you think, hey, here, I'm meditating. Those slobs over there, they're unspiritual. They're not as good as I am. Right? Then the spiritual task is to do the meditation with more humility, do it with more awareness. Or perhaps if you've got a really developed meditation practice, the point might be to stop meditating and go out and join in the Occupy Boston forces, or a strike, or whatever, you know, anti-war movement. Right? OK, so spiritual practices are a matter of context. All right. If you begin to get a taste of what spirituality is, the pursuit, the engagement with these virtues, in a context in which we develop a sense of acceptance for our life on this earth, then let's look very quickly at a couple of, of, uh, of uh, criticisms of it. You might think of two unlikely, maybe not so unlikely, bedfellows, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Ayn Rand. Nietzsche says that religious virtues, religious values better, are a defense mechanism against the inherent weakness of people who are lazy, dumb, incompetent, lacking any kind of physical clout. 
right? So they talk about peacemaking and humility because they're too damn weak to do anything about the people who have their foot on their feet on their neck. Ayn Rand says this idea of compassion and concern for others is a betrayal of reason and leads to a social setting in which people are constantly dependent on other people, constantly begging them, and in the end, those people will still need the hard-nosed, entrepreneurial, clever, creative people who make things, make machines, and make corporations. There's a level, of course, on which both Nietzsche and Rand are right, which is to say people adopt philosophical positions or sets of values, in a sense, to meet the needs of their own personality. Whether that personality feels like it's, it's afflicted with pain that it can't do anything about, or it feels very aggressive, the way Rand and, and Nietzsche kind of felt. It's not surprising that people adopt points of view that work for them. Yet what they're missing, Rand more than Nietzsche, who had a more complex, nuanced view of Christianity and of ascetic practices generally, what they're missing is the way spirituality makes us stronger. Spirituality makes us more competent, more able to function, more rational. Spiritual social activists engage in extremely difficult social campaigns with intelligence, with courage, and with great dedications. People doing spiritual social service work can deal with the dead and the dying, can initiate complicated projects of social betterment. People who engage in practices like yoga and meditation develop incredible control over their bodies and their minds. It's a kind of paradox that while we might turn to spirituality because we feel weak, we feel hopeless, we feel helpless, it makes us stronger. I argue in the book in great detail that these spiritual virtues can be found throughout religious history. You find them in Mahayana Buddhism, which talks about compassion. You find it in the Sufi tradition, which is the mystical tradition of Islam, which talks about the love of God, the selfless love of God. You find it in Hasidic Judaism, which, uh, exaggerate, which emphasizes the love, uh, the joy that comes from loving God despite the lack in your life. And you find it in Christianity. If you rewrite the Gospels in a slightly modern language, you have Jesus saying, not believe A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but rather be kind, be compassionate, don't pump yourself up, follow God, but don't talk to everybody else, anybody, anybody else about how holy you are. He sounds like any other spiritual teacher. What's the difference between spirituality and tradition and spirituality now? What does it mean when people say they are spiritual but not religious? Well, this is a complicated question. I'll just talk briefly about one issue here, the issue of truth. Okay. From a conventional, traditional, religious standpoint, it's very often considered very important what is true. You think of uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They all believe there is a single God. He may have three different zip codes in Christianity, but it's still one God. Uh, a single God created the universe, has certain intentions towards human beings, wants human beings to behave in a certain kind of way, and has some kind of capability of response to us. This is absolutely true. For, for further details, see our revealed scriptures. Okay. Anybody within those traditional settings who says, okay, this, is, this works for me, but something else might work for somebody else, from a traditional point of view, this is absolutely wrong. This is heresy. For this, we drum you out of the core, because this is not how it works. This is the only true thing. In this sense of the term truth, the word truth is used the same way we might say it's true that Abraham Lincoln is dead, and therefore it's not true that he's alive. It's true that Gottlieb is wearing a, a watch on his right, on his right wrist. If you admit to the four beers you had before the accident, you've told the truth. If you deny that you took the six chocolate chip cookies from the jar, you're lying. In that sense of truth, it's very clear. There are, however, other ways in which we use the term true. We talk about a true friend, a true marriage, a true, truly great composer. In those ways, we invoke certain concepts of excellence, of quality, of meaningfulness. But when you invoke those, you are not negating or even conceiving necessarily of something which is a limited, specific opposite. Anna Karenina by Tolstoy is a great novel. But what's the opposite of Anna Karenina? I haven't the faintest idea. Right? There are countless ways to be great. That doesn't mean it's easy to be great. That doesn't mean anything goes. 
It means that the idea that there is only one truth, or that it's literally true, or that the individual cannot decide what is working for them in order for them to develop along the spiritual path. <coughs> That's the key difference between traditional, spiritual, traditional religion, or even religion now, and spirituality. It's the idea that truth is used in this other way. Beethoven is a great composer. So is Tupac Shakur. So is Webern. <coughs> Look how different their music is. One does not exclude the other. Why? Because the purpose of music is not to represent, but to transform you through an experience of art. The goal of language in a spiritual context is not to represent the universe. Thomas Akempis, a great uh, medieval Catholic teacher who wrote some wonderful book called The Imitation of Christ, said, I would rather know how to be benevolent than how to define it. St. Augustine said, the mind is at its highest point when it realizes it can't represent God. Taoism says there's words and there's meaning. Once the words give you the meaning, you don't have to worry about the words. Or I say, descriptions of God, spiritual truth, revelation, all that kind of stuff, are like words on a menu. You don't want to go into a restaurant and eat the menu. And if there's nothing on the menu you want, go into the kitchen. Mess around. Cook up your own. So the difference between traditional spirituality and modern spirituality is that these virtues occurred in both, but in the old school they tended to be encapsulated by, embodied in traditions, married to certain metaphysical positions, whereas in the modern one, they're not. One final critical point, and then I'll read you one more thing, and then uh, we'll be done, having left out a great deal, which I'm sure people can raise in for questions. Somebody might say, look, it's crazy of you to use the word spirituality, to apply to something that's manifested by Mahayana Buddhism 2,300 years ago and people like Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield who are contemporary Jews turned Buddhist teachers who teach 30 miles away from here at Barry, the Buddhist center in Barry. Whatever Nagar Nagarjuna, who was a second century AD Indian uh, Buddhist philosopher, a very important one, whatever he understood by the virtues, it can't be what Goldstein and Kornfield understand. Uh, Thomas Akempis, 13th century, can't have the same understanding of Catholicism as somebody like Joan Chittister, who's a nun who preaches an expansive and feminist Catholicism. How could it be the same thing? For two reasons. Here's the reason why I think it's valid to use the same term. Number one, we have a concept of a tradition in which later manifestations of a body of thought or practice or art or something like that can be understood as coming out of earlier ones. Goldstein and Cornfield, with the way they teach Buddhism, might not be recognized by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. But Kornstein, Goldstein and Cornfield recognize the Buddha. Mer uh, um, a Kempis might not recognize Chittister, but Chitter Chittister defines herself as carrying on a tradition of people like Thomas A. Kempis. She wrote a whole book on St. Benedict. Right? Could Newton understand quantum mechanics? I don't think so. But quantum mechanics can be traced historically from a tradition of physics that goes from Newton to the present. Same thing with Beethoven and Webern, or Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Andy Warhol. So we have this concept of tradition in which the later comes out of the earlier and is shaped by it. That's one reason, though, a concept of spirituality can reach back so far. Second reason, to go back to my Marxist roots, uh, Marxism says that ideology, ideas, beliefs, religions, all that kind of stuff, are really shaped broadly by the mode of production since, the Marxists might argue, clearly 2,500 years ago, they have very different economic structure, different mode of production, different sociological structures than we have. How can the same set of ideas be found in both? Not possible. Ahistorical. Tut, tut. My response is, we really do have more in common with the Buddha or Mahayana Buddhism, or 12th century Sufis uh, like Rumi and Hafiz, we have more in common with them than you might think. They have families, we have families. They have some kind of centralized state government, so do we. They have economic enterprises, so do we. They have technology, so do we. They have tensions between the individual and the group, so do we. They have a restless mind problem. In the Bhagavad Gita, which is roughly 2,200 years ago, the hero says, man, the mind, it's as hard to control as the wind. Let's try meditating for 20 minutes. You'll see what he's talking about. There's no difference there. Certain essential problems of human life have not changed. The key question of Plato's Republic is what? Is it better to be a good man, thought immoral, 
or an immoral man who's thought good. Now that's as up to date to every politician lying about his sex past or about some corporation covering up its environmental crimes. The virtues of spirituality were keyed, were invented to deal with such issues, such problems, such pains, such questions. And those are still with us. All right, so many things to leave out. It's really quite cute. OK, so one of the long chapters in the book is on spirituality and healing. There are three, as it were, case studies, one on healing, one on nature, and one on politics. The one on healing deals with uh, the way in which meditation and yoga have been integrated into medical practice now. University of Massachusetts Medical School has been a pioneer of this with their mindfulness-based stress reduction pro uh, program. We now know through research that emotions exist ontologically both as experiences and as molecular transformations of the body. Things like yoga and meditation have been proven to be really quite valuable with a whole host of ailments. But there's another dimension of spirituality in healing, which is how does the person who's sick deal with their loss of function or their deterioration? And the third context is the one that has to do with somebody who's caretaking. So now I will return again to my own life and talk about my daughter, Esther's. The key question here is, how can spirituality help us deal with a situation that inevitably causes pain? One Friday evening at the Reformed Temple I attend, instead of the usual rabbi's sermon, my family got up to talk about our experience of having a child with severe disabilities. My then 14-year-old daughter Esther, who suffers from cognitive limitations, weak muscles, partial deafness, anxiety disorder, severe scoliosis, and a metabolic disorder, spoke last. At one point, she raised her head from her carefully prepared text, looked directly at the 500 or so people gathered for the service, and said, to you parents who have kids with special needs, I have one thing to say. Don't blame yourselves. It's not your fault. If parents of handicapped children don't feel it is our fault, as Esther suggested we might, very often we will feel that it is our responsibility to fix it. And if we can't, we wonder how it is possible for us to live a life of anything but anguish when our children are in pain, terribly limited, socially isolated, endlessly frustrated, or dying. Spirituality properly teaches us to find the good in life of being detached from our desires. But what does it mean to detach from the suffering of others, especially if the other is my child? In conventional terms, disability is simply a profound failure. As a friend said to me soon after she was born, having a child like Esther is every parent's worst nightmare. Occasionally, of course, we see a TV drama in which there is a heroic triumph, the one-legged girl who runs the marathon, the charming boy with Down syndrome. These images only emphasize how bereft are all the others who are not special, who do not beat the odds, or are not at all cute. When youth, physical beauty, career success, and a well-ordered portfolio are the ideal, children who cannot read or walk seem simply to be a loss. As the mother of a developmentally delayed son in the poignant documentary Best Boy says, if you want to know heartache, have a retarded child. The negatives of disability are all too obvious. Thousands of hours spent in doctor's offices, searching online for alternative treatments, meeting with special teachers, and interviewing home health aides. Lost sleep, friends, money, vacations, and career possibilities and witnessing our children's suffering. And there is a kind of stigma in a culture with a profound inability to tolerate pain, that's us, uh, the disabled are often shunned. Is there anything else? Can parents of children with disabilities find a spiritual rewrite of the dominant social narrative when miraculous cures do not materialize? For even the best medical attention, 25 holistic healers, home study programs, encouraging her to exercise before she gets to watch TV, purchasing 37 overpriced computer learning programs, and doing hooked on phonics together, Esther has remained Esther. She is sweet, emotionally wise, far beyond her IQ, a surprisingly not bad shot with a basketball from seven feet out, and in many ways very, very impaired. A spiritual reinterpretation of the value of Esther's life can, I believe, begin with a spiritual reinterpretation of my own as Esther's father. This will first of all be rooted in an honest acknowledgement of what is possible. Who, after all, told me that I had the power to heal everything that is broken in the world? At the same time, I cannot walk away from the obligations that have been placed before me. I must do what can be done, even while knowing that a good deal of what I do may accomplish little. Many of the world's traditional spiritual teachings focus on this dilemma. 
The warrior prince Arjuna, hero of the Hindu religious poem Bhagavad Gita, is instructed by the god Krishna to fulfill his social duty but release his attachment to the results of his actions. Buddhists counsel us to realize that the problem is not that the world is uncontrollable, but that we do not accept this fundamental truth. And they emphasize it is essential that we show compassion for all who suffer, no matter what else we cannot do. Kierkegaard said flatly that to avoid despair, we need to give up our attachment to world historical accomplishments and concentrate on living principal ethical lives. The Talmud, expressing the intention rather than the accomplishments of love, teaches us that to save one person is like saving the world. We cannot cure the Esters, but we can love them because they too are made in the image of God, because they suffer and deserve compassion, because they were given to us, because we can see how hard they're working at life, because they have their own gifts. We can train ourselves to convey to them that we believe in the meaning of their lives, no matter how restricted those lives are. We can have faith, not necessarily in an all-powerful God who has hidden plans, but in the value of what is right before our eyes, a smile, a laugh, children who crawl before they, because they cannot walk, coo at us because they cannot talk, and will themselves to keep going day after day, despite everything. With us, such a spiritually rather than religiously oriented faith, my parental responsibility has a clear purpose. A mother of a deaf child says having a child with a disability makes you slow down and enjoy him or her, perhaps more than most parents whose children are not disabled. I'm not saying I'm a better parent, just that I'm more appreciative of this little creature of God. If this is not easy, and a good deal of time feels nearly impossible, this is another reminder that the extreme rewards of spiritual life come at an extreme cost. If we can love our limited children, perhaps we can also find some well-deserved self-acceptance as well. For don't all of us have limitations, disabilities? Aren't there many things others can do that we cannot? Many lessons we just don't seem able to learn, insights that don't stick, bad habits we can't shake. Thus, in learning to appreciate my disabled child, I can perhaps learn to appreciate the disabled father that I am. My plethora of physical limits, emotional immaturities, and spiritual shortcomings notwithstanding. Esther is far from perfect, so am I. If learning to accept Esther teaches me to do the same thing for myself and other people, is that not a precious gift? If I can be accepting and compassionate to Esther even though she has multiple disabilities, perhaps I can do the same for myself, even though sometimes I'm nasty, not as successful as I'd hoped, or just plain dumb. A spiritual response to cancer or heart disease is twofold. Actively use all the possible resources, including meditation, yoga, and spiritual attitudes to support recovery. And also accept what cannot be cured and find a spiritual meaning for pain and loss. The same is true for any parent of a handicapped child. Typically, there is much to be done that will help our children function better, enjoy life more, or at least be in less pain. But in the end, the only aspect of Esther's life that I can really control with any degree of certainty is the part in which I offer her love and give up my desperate attachment to results. Again, the theme of attachment. In this dimension, the task is not to cure her, but to accept the value of my own love, even if it won't cure her. And there can be surprising moments of grace. A mother tells us that having an autistic child means a bleak realization that a mother's love isn't always enough but also an unexpected joy at the smallest of life's mercies. A crooked smile, a shirt buttoned, a word remembered, a name scrawled on certainty on a piece of paper. Philosopher Eva Kate writes that Sesha, her multiply handicapped daughter who cannot walk or speak, is a teacher of love. Esther herself can be funny, caring, and emotionally insightful. When asked what she, saw, what she thought the secret of life was, she replied without hesitation, to love people. In several collections of writings by parents of children with disabilities, this basic spiritual response to disability is repeated. The pain is not erased, but it has a different meaning. And this meaning is not hopelessness. The most important things I've learned since having a disabled child, says the mother of a cognitively limited, severely epileptic daughter, is that the whole purpose of our existence is to love and be loved. Thus, love is the one sure ticket out of the cul-de-sac of despair that disabilities can cause, and I would add, other despair as well. For it is only love in the end that we can control. From Rumi to Jesus, from the Bodhisattva to Gandhi, is this not the quintessential spiritual lesson? The father of a child with autism assures us the sorrow, though unwelcome, can be a pathway to an unconditional love that grows from a realization of the intrinsic beauty of each child's existence. 
We parents of children with disabilities can feel fine about ourselves when we grasp this and give up superficial achievement-based values. All the things taking place, says Buddhist Chögyam Trungpa, no matter how disturbing, are helpful as long as we have a sense that we are treading on the path. With that sense, we can live with our pain rather than fearing that it will destroy us. This need to undergo and understand our suffering and to change towards new values is a basic narrative core of world spirituality. The Jewish experience of slavery and liberation, the crucifixion of Jesus, the ascetic wanderings of the Buddha, Muhammad's flight through the desert. In a spiritual sense, all these are about a kind of death and rebirth, about a profound anguish that makes life possible deepened by love, broadened by compassion, and illuminated by appreciation for the beauties of daily existence. These stories are most emphatically not about a life in which nothing is lost. Jesus had his moments of despair on the cross. Joseph had to be sold into slavery before he could become the Pharaoh's assistant. Suffering, said C.S. Lewis, after his wife died of cancer, is God's wake-up call. But what is it we are to wake up to? To accepting that a life that we cannot control, that may be enormously painful, is still a life worth living. From a spiritual point of view, each person is of infinite value because each person, if looked at properly, can help us with the infinite important task of finding our true nature, loving God, or reaching enlightenment. Unlike the SATs, baseball games, or Wall Street, in this context, disability is no handicap. If we pay attention, anyone can be our teacher. One summer afternoon, Esther is practicing basketball with our portable hoop taking shot after shot, which I rebound for her in the driveway. Bright sun, 85 degrees, and Esther is sweating and red-faced in her special undershirt, thick plastic back brace, and t-shirt. For a moment, she stops, looks up at the cloudless sky, and shakes her fist. God, she yells, that's her calling me, God, she yells, I am really angry at you. Why did you give me these special needs? Why did you give me so much pain? I'm sick of it. I just want to be normal. She shakes her fist one more time. Motions for me to pass her the ball and shoots again. Swish, she gets it in. Now her arms are raised in joy. <laughs> Sit up straight in your chair. Let your eyes gently close. Focus again your attention on your breath. And now, if you will, ask yourself, is there anything you particularly want to remember from what you just listened to? And now, if you will, ask yourself, is there anything you particularly want to inquire into further? And now just let your mind rest. Follow the course of your breath. And slowly and gently open your eyes. Okay, thank you very much. If you have questions, thoughts, please. Yes, sir. I have a question which is not really about what you say, which I found very interesting, but about an adjective which was used when you were introduced. I believe John talked about environmental spiritualism. Right. OK. Uh, it's very hard to take a 225-page book and do everything, so I left that out. Uh, the I basic idea is that what some people get from meditation, what some people get from church, they get from nature. That a proper, spiritually proper relationship with nature does the same thing that other spiritual practices do, which is to call out a ability to transcend our ego, live with a certain kind of balance, uh, let go of certain kinds of attachment. There are particular places where this is emphasized very strongly and developed very well. 
Indigenous spirituality is one of them, and what's called ecofeminism is another example. This is historically a very old reality to human beings. You can find it in the Bible. You can find it you know, throughout the centuries, the last 25 centuries, this kind of response. It's also the case that in the contemporary world, something is different, namely that human practices are violating, destroying, poisoning both non-human nature and human nature. That's what we call the environmental crisis. So in this particular kind of spirituality, there's a very direct and immediate propulsion from a spiritual response to a forest, to the ocean, to an orca or something, and towards a certain kind of social involvement in dealing with it. And this is manifest in a variety of contexts that uh, ha often have to do with very practical politics. You find these kinds of values, spiritual values, stressed by secular political organizations, by religious environmentalism, by activists of all kinds. <coughs> to, to continue that line of thought, I mean, this was I think the first time, if I'm not mistaken, where you, you mentioned going aside from individuals like Esther, going out to others. What what is is there any role for for the social, the yes. community? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's take one of the key spiritual virtues: gratitude. Right? Instead of thinking about what we don't have, we think about what we have. Instead of taking it all for granted. I mean, Aldous Huxley said that <clears throat> human beings have an almost infinite capacity for taking things for granted. <laughs> we treasure what we have. Now, how does this lead us to politics? Very simply, what is it that you're grateful for? If you're on the deck of your $3 million chalet in the mountains, <clears throat> in a gated community that you have a good security system to keep the riffraff out, and you got the money from that by having a factory, a polluting factory in a third world country, and you pay off the local uh, police to shoot the peasants who don't like the pollution, then gratitude is not appropriate. You need a, pol a politics, a political perspective, in order to manifest the spiritual virtues. Take another example. <coughs> there is a concept in Buddhism called upaya, which roughly translates as skill in means. So if you're going to be compassionate to people, you have to be skillful. Well, to be skillful, you have to have some knowledge. Now, where are you going to, as a spiritual person, where are you going to get the knowledge that enables you to understand what the application of compassion means today? In part, you have to get it from politics. You can no more understand global capitalism by reading uh, sorry, who is that? Yeah, that's Esther. <laughs> Esther, I'm giving a lecture, okay? I was just talking about you, but I can't talk now. Okay, bye-bye, honey. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, you give somebody a cell phone, you're dead forever. Okay. Um, uh, so you can't get that from spiritual, great spiritual texts, no matter how great they are, without adding in political theory. Uh, one of my things that I've done with my writing for the last 20 years is talk about how spirituality requires politics and politics requires spirituality. It's not just that spirituality requires political understanding in order to express itself, in order to be authentic and not to be narcissistic and self-interested, but that spiritual traditions have certain kinds of gifts that they can give to the political arena. Here you see the behavior of people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Aung San Suu Kyi or Chi, I never know how to pronounce her name, the woman who's leading the struggle for democracy in Myanmar. You can see the value of their kind of nonviolent approach. So that would be that. But uh, yes, I absolutely think, I mean, 40 years ago I gave a talk <coughs> at University of Connecticut. The talk was, why do bodhisattvas belong in the barricades? Bodhisattvas are the saints of Mahayana Buddhism. Bodhisattvas belong in the barricades. Yeah. I have a two-part question. First one is, how do we get this book? Uh, you'll have to wait. Thank you. It's, I'm sending it in on Thursday. <coughs> sending it on Thursday to Oxford. If you want something that has some of these elements, uh, I wrote a book called The Spirituality of Resistance, which, was asked, which asked the question, what is authentic spirituality in an age of ecocide? The concept of spirituality was less developed, but there was a very detailed in the age of what? ecocide, like the death of the eco, like oh. genocide is the death of... <coughs> So a spirituality resistance, where I go into this, and I have some interesting stuff about work, the role of work, and environmental ethics, and what do we do with our anger? I was much more angry back then. <laughs> so it was 15 years ago, it's, you know, people change. That's all. But uh, spirituality resistance will give you, they'll tide you over till this one comes out. <laughs> um, yes, second part. And then, <clears throat> Just take your hand away from your mouth. Sorry. That's right. I think you, that example you gave, which sounded like you'd thought about it before, of like the person in their chalet, Right. Like, have you ever had the opportunity to like actually talk and like share this perspective that you have with somebody 
who might be characterized like that? And yeah, well, it, like it, it, a little <clears throat> not quite so uh, dramatic, but the same kind of thing. Many years ago, I was in. I, I spent a. Yeah, a year and a quarter bumming around India, and I, I was living up in the Himalayas, and there were a few other, you know, Westerners living there too. And I met this guy, and you know, we're all stoned and having a great time. It was nice. And he said, you know, can't you see the whole world just getting better and better? So I said, look, I'm having a good time here. I mean, I don't have any money, but you don't need much money the way we were living. And I'm, India is incredibly interesting, and this is great. But, you know, the people in Vietnam are getting bombed by American bombers. They're not probably having such a great time. And think about the people starving on the streets of Calcutta. And he just looked at me. He literally went like this. <laughs> he didn't want to know. Right? Look, there is a tremendous amount of spirituality that's glitzy, that's narcissistic, that's self-indulgent. <clears throat> but that doesn't distinguish spirituality from anything else. There's a tremendous amount of Marxism that supported Stalin's incredibly brutal repression. There's an incredible amount of science and technology that are just slaves to capitalism, produce garbage that pollutes, right? And there's an incredible amount of art that's just trendy and self-indulgent. Yeah. So everything, not to mention, you know, the Catholic sex abuse scandal, which, you know, one just needs to say that to get the point, right? So. Every form of human endeavor has its dark side, its failures, its pseudo forms. It's fine to criticize the mistaken versions or the distorted versions of spirituality as long as one realizes that from wherever one is coming from, one's got the same apologies to make. Right. <clears throat> yeah? Do you think that machines are capable of spirituality, or would you say that spirituality is a fundamentally human characteristic? I don't know. I have no idea what machines can do, but, you know, a machine can only be capable of spirituality if a machine could ask itself the following question. Should I follow the orders I've just been given? Right, that would be the first step. Should I? Ought I? Is it a good idea? Right? You know, it can follow the orders, but it can't question the structure of having the orders itself. How about that's, data? That's data an, can. What? So data. Star Trek. Oh, no, well, that. Look, I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference what the material is. The question is, what can, what can it do? So it's made of silicon or, you know, old shoes. I don't care. But that's what it has to do in order to, to have the beginnings of a spiritual identity. <clears throat> it has to be able to suffer, right? And to deal with suffering. It has to be able to feel compassion. Whatever, whatever, how we structure that, which is not a, which is an easy thing if, it's an, if the person who's suffering is nice and you don't have to do too much for them. But if they're a real schmuck who inflicts it on themselves, then it's hard. Or it's even harder to have compassion on somebody who's really bad, right? I mean, think of the people who, who flew, the, flew the planes on 9-11. Is it possible to have compassion for them, even if you hate what they did? And feel that these are people suffering from an enormous kind of disorientation, inability to empathize, a tremendous cutoff from other human beings. Now, that's a terrible thing to live like one. That, that ain't easy. <laughs> oh, one, one more, one one more? more question, then mm -hmm. we have some food coming. Right. Better get it. Or I sang it? for my supper, so. I... <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you just said that uh, you would have to be able to experience suffering. Are you then implying that a human being who hasn't experienced real suffering can't be spiritual? <sighs> Well, as I said in the beginning, you know, the, the source of spirituality is usually suffering, but then there's also this kind of sudden miraculous upsurge that can happen. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I don't think I could imagine a human being incapable of suffering, because, you know, unless somebody was born enlightened, because unless you're born enlightened, you have the normal structure of the ego. If you have the normal structure of the ego, you're going to suffer. You're going to want what you can't have. You're going to get bored. Uh, you're going to compare yourself to others. You're going to keep driving yourself in one way or another. You know, uh, it Job said, uh, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. So I would say similarly, we're, we're born to suffer. It's an American fantasy that because we have 32 different types of toothpaste in the supermarket, that therefore we're not going to suffer anymore which is why we have such a hard time confronting suffering. I mean, I have heard, I, I heard of, of somebody say, she's a, a child of survivors of the Holocaust. She said, she, and she lived here her whole life, but, but she said she never felt at home in America until after 9-11. Because only after 9-11 did it sink into the American mind that suffering, a lack of control, trauma, was this kind of universal possibility. Okay. 
If you consider America as sort of the land where we attempt to substitute technology and goodies for spirituality, how's that working out for us? Every longitudinal psychological study of America shows people are increasingly bored, anxious, and depressed. The more the richer China gets, the more China has problems with its mental health. The World Health Organization estimates that by the year 2020, depression will be the first or second most prevalent illness in the world. The more we have, the more unhappy we are. That's one reason there's so much interest in spirituality now, because spirituality says there's an alternative way to live. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. Um, I live with a lot of atheists, and I just wonder if there's a well, I mean, I did, there were a couple of lines in there where I think I said it, you know, with God or without God. The important thing is the spiritual virtues. You can root those spiritual virtues in because Jesus said so, or you can root them in because it makes sense to me, or you can root them in, the way I do it, I think life is a miracle. I think it really is a miracle that I'm here. Now, you don't really have God to have a miracle, a miracle in the sense that it's a gift, that I'm blessed to be here. And that if I want to find my way through this life in the best, the most productive way possible, I'll do it with spirituality. You can do it with trees. You can do it with goddess worship, where it's the imminent spirit of the rocks and the river and the birds that is your sense of the sacred. You can do it with any of those things. It's not. The metaphysics are unimportant. Within certain versions of spiritual traditions, that's what they say too. Right? If you read the Sufi mystics, they say, you know, all this stuff about God, just get drunk. Right? They're drunk, and to be drunk is, is their image for an encounter with God. Just get drunk. Forget about all this other stuff. If you read Thomas Akempis, 14th century Catholic, right? He does talk about a lot about God, but he talks more about deal with your own sins, deal with your own problems, deal with your own arrogance, learn to be compassionate and helpful to other people. So the metaphysics becomes unimportant. Look, we're talking beings. So we're going to talk. We're believing beings, so we're going to believe. But what happens is that the more spiritual, the more you bracket those beliefs. Right? The more you bracket them. You bracket them how? You bracket them, this is what I need in order to galvanize myself towards gratitude, towards generosity, towards compassion. You have a different thing? Fine. I mean, if I'm sick, should you take my medicine? Only if you have exactly the same disease, in which case we can both have the same metaphysics. But if it's like medicine, then of course you don't want to have to take mine. So the, from a spiritual point of view, talk about God is not really important. I mean, it, 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 that, that, it can be very important for you, in which case it's very important for you. You know, it's like if you're, you write a poem about a sunset, right? It really moves you. Fine, it doesn't move me. It's your poem. That's, what, what's the problem? I mean, one of the Sufis, I forget, I'm getting tired, so I forget. He, he said, my heart in his abode for people who come from the temple, for Jews, for Muslims, for Hindus, no matter how many times you've sinned and broken your vows, it doesn't make any difference, he said. Come. That's the basic idea. Yeah, it's the fight. Um, a lot of times you, uh, you talk about how you don't have to give up your ego in. Right. Can you um, elaborate on exactly what you mean by ego in this context? Okay, well, I take myself as a very clear example. You know, I'm very proud of the fact that I've written blah, 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 many books and blah, blah, blah articles, and I can give so many talks, and I'm, that's me, and that's who I am, and look at me, and I'll show it off to people, and I'll present it, and I'll cultivate everybody's respect for me, that kind of stuff. That's ego, right? The opposite of that is not to not do it, but to do it with a sense of there's a kind of service in what I'm doing. I'm offering something to other people, you know, like a flower to a garden, as somebody once said. So you mean, like, pride then? What? So you mean, like, pride then? Pride, arrogance, attachment, self-control, self-identity. This is who I am. This is who I am now. This is what I'm doing, but it's not who I am. So it's a matter of, think of a parent giving love to a child. You love the child, you don't demand but they have a certain religion, go to a certain college, have certain attitudes. You love them, the kind of acceptance. Think of being able to let somebody die without anguish, with love and compassion, but without anguish. Think of um, the Dalai Lama, right? Who said, there's a great line, he said, the Chinese have taken so much from me, right? Took the Tibetan home, took their home. The Chinese have taken so much from me, I will not give them my peace of mind. I will not give them my peace of mind. Right? 
So he's not so identified. I mean, he spent his whole life trying to get things back there. He's not going to give up his peace of mind. Right? We can do that with anything. Then we've surrendered our ego in a certain kind of way. I may say so. Uh, some spiritual teacher said that humans can't live by bread alone. He or she was mistaken. <laughs> so we have food here. Come. Um, Ask Kinlick. Like he's dying in America. I, I would like us once more to thank Roger and, and stick around if you can. Thank you very much.